Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all keeping very, very well. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we've just ticked over 7 p.m. I know a few of you are waiting. I know some of you are joining, having a look at the numbers there. So I'll wait a couple of seconds and then we'll get started. Um, but first of all, just a thank you for coming on tonight. I do appreciate the support and uh, I hope in turn I can offer you lots of good information and value towards the world of property investing, the world of sourcing. So, uh, but tonight, yeah, we are talking about how to find properties, especially with the way the economy is right now. It's quite an important thing to know how to find them, know what to look for, and also how to start sourcing. That seems to be a regular question and occurrence that I'm having. So, first of all, we are live. The positive to that is that, of course, um, you can tune in, you can ask questions. Uh, the negative being, I might make some mistakes along the way. So just roll with me, bear with me. Uh, there's lots of you watching, which is really cool. So thank you for tuning in. Tonight we are, we're talking about finding property deals, starting sourcing. We're going to be covering um, the three reasons that you can't find properties at the moment. We're going to be talking about the methods that I use to find houses. And then we're going to talk about how sourcing works. So obviously, as you might or might not know, I've started a sourcing business about 12 months ago and seen a large amount of success from that. Um, I'm then gonna make you an exclusive offer just at the end there, and we'll go into the Q&A. Total time that you'll be with me is about 40 to 60 minutes. And this session really is best for beginner investors. There's a few things in here which will be good for um, slightly more advanced investors, um, but also for beginner sources. So three things very quickly before we go any further. Number one, I think I've already mentioned it, but stick around because we've got the Q&A at the end. I want to spend more time in this part if I can. I think actually answering your live questions will be quite an exciting thing to do. Number two, get that notepad out and start getting ready to make some notes. Number three, I just ask you for commitment. You know, you're here. I'm here on a Thursday. I'd normally be out playing hockey, um, which is something I do in my spare time. But I wanted to come on here. I think it's a Thursday at 7 p.m. is quite a good evening for people. So I chose tonight so I could come on here, give some value, I guess, share with you some of the things I've learned over the last 12 months of sourcing and the last three years of investing. Um, so quickly, a bit about me. You might have seen me talk about me myself before. So I tried to change it up with each slideshow that I do and each presentation. But I have definitely shared this image before. It makes me laugh every time I see it. Um, but I was an estate agent for seven and a half years. That was um, over and out the back of the last recession. And I think it was like 2015, maybe, uh, that I stopped. Um, so, yeah, I was an estate agent for seven and a half years, learned a lot of things. Um, but I am now full time in property. So I'm a full time property investor, full time sourcer. And I do obviously a bit of uh, training, educating on the side as well. Um, in between, the estate agency and being in property. I had another job, but that's not important anymore. I didn't enjoy it. And I'm full-time property. That's the main thing. So and the other thing I do, of course, as I've mentioned, is I, I invest in properties. So in 2019, this lovely, vibrant greenhouse was my first ever buy to let. Still is green to this day. I couldn't, couldn't change the color of it. Um, I liked it too much. But it was my first ever buy to let. I was incredibly nervous and it took a lot to go and buy that when I live quite far away but I took the plunge and honestly that one decision changed I guess the, the way in which my the direction in which my life was going to take um, I then took a, a little a little gap a little break from buying um, due to this thing that kept us indoors for a little while um, but then back 2021 I hit the ground running I did a buy refurbish refinance style project um, the house did a full refurb did loads there this year I've been a bit busier back to buying and I'm trying to buy in, in bigger numbers this year. So the first one on the left that you can see is a house that I just bought and completely renovated. It's actually just hit the rental market uh, this week. And then the other property on the right, anyone that knows me, you know, might not actually be that familiar with this because I haven't really announced or talked about it much yet, but I bought this house in June as well. Um, I've actually sold that onto another investor to be able to fund future projects that I've got going on. I will share some more information on that at some point, but for the time being, just wanted to um, focus on the other refurb that I've been doing. Not only that, but I've been, uh, I've been quite busy. I've been doing a four meter extension on the bungalow. I physically wasn't doing it, but had builders in. They've been doing that. It's a very big dist uh, distraction, but 
I've learned such a considerable amount of uh, things from that, which is great. So, um, yeah, that's the the sort of four meter extension that we've added, and it's been an incredible experience. I would I'd definitely do another one. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, but meanwhile, whilst all of that's going on, I have also been sourcing and selling, uh, in fact, over 40 properties to different investors over the last 12 months, uh, which had you told me that, you know, only a year or two ago would have, would have blown my mind because I was, I was quite sceptical about sourcing in the old days, but uh, not so much now. I invest and I also source far away from home. So I do all of that five hours away from home. Um, so don't tell me it's not possible because I do it every day. I do it remotely. And I do that all under the brand name Property X, uh, which hopefully you've heard of. This is now my, this is my baby, the Property X. So that is me. Um, and I always like to just share that for anyone that is new to the channel or isn't so familiar with me. That's like my last 10 years encompassed in as, as few a slides as possible. I could talk to you a lot more. I like talking about myself, but you're here to learn, you're here to find out some, some new information. Um, so the first thing we're gonna learn or we're gonna cover is the three limiting beliefs that are stopping you from investing in property. And the reason I wanted to start here is because one of the most frequent questions that I get is from new investors and they, you know, or not questions, but one of the most uh, frequent concerns is the market seems really busy. There's loads of people out there. And every time I go to do a viewing, there's multiple people, multiple offers. And on top of that, I've now got concerns of a recession. Um, so I think it's important to address some of these things. Um, and there are three, I, I would say, current things that are stopping people from diving in and getting involved with investing. Um, the first one, quite simply, is actually, even though a lot of us save money or have money in the bank, a lot of us think that property is for rich people. And um, that couldn't be further from the truth. It's just something that we, we have in our, in our minds, or some of us do. And although you might think, yeah, I'm going to invest in property, if that's even in the back of your mind a little bit, we need, to, we need to work past that because property is not for rich people. It is for rich people once you've built up a portfolio. Yes, I guess. But to start with, anyone can get in, involved in this with the right information and with the right money, the right capital. Um, take me, you know, back in 2019 when I bought that first house for £58,000. That's £16,405, which I had in the bank, which I'd saved up, was literally the only savings I had. So it's not like I was, you know, had a big bank balance and I just thought, you know, let's just give it a go. That was everything I had. And it was it took a lot to earn that money and it took a lot to actually spend and invest that money because it had taken so much to, to, to get that money together. When I eventually did, it was that one decision, which I've already said, that changed my, the direction of my whole life because then I, I learned how to property invest. Um, it's nothing like just getting out there and doing it. Um, but also then you start to learn about the other things you can do in order to scale quicker. Um, and as I've said, you are only one decision away from changing your life. The, the other thing you can see here is in October 2019, throughout the process of buying that Vitalet, I started documenting it on this very channel. So that's the other thing that's changed my life. Without that buy to let, I wouldn't have changed things. Without um, this YouTube channel, I wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't be in property full time. This YouTube channel has been a gateway to investors so that I can source properties for them, um, so that I can learn information. So um, make sure you make those decisions. You know, um, We really are that one, that one decision away. Um, going back to the whole property for rich people thing, we need to reprogram our mind to think bigger. You know, right now there's a lot of scary and ridiculous headlines, to be quite frank, that are stressing people out. And I get they're stressing people out because they impact us financially and um, make our conditions unstable, you know, month to month. But, you know, we see headlines like this and probably they, there is an element of truth behind them, but it's, they are more there for a scare factor. They're trying to make you feel a certain way so then you read an article so that the media can get what they want out of you. And rather than stressing over, out over those headlines, we need to reprogram the way that we think. And one simple, the real, in a really simple form, way that I want to explain this to you is the average income is £30,000 a month. Let's, that's a month, a, a year, a month. That would be nice. £30,000 a year. And uh, I think that's very approximately, that's right. It might actually be slightly under that, but let's just take that as our average. That is two and a half thousand pounds per month before tax. 
And if we worked off of that as, as our average, as our basis, person A, you know, there's two types of people out there. And person A, person one, they would think, I need to reduce my outgoings. I need to try and save 200 pounds a month by not eating out. Or I need to buy new clothes. Uh, sorry, stop buying new clothes. And all of those things are, you know, yes, it's fine to do once, but what happens when inflation continues or the cost of living continues to rise six months later? There's only so far you can reduce your outgoings. There's only so far you can go with this. And I was having this chat with um, Elliot, who, who's been a mentor of mine. I was over at his house yesterday and we were having this exact conversation is the narrative is for people to try and save. And people like Martin Money Lewis is fantastic. He's trying to help you save. But he's, what he should be also doing is encouraging people, in, in my opinion, to learn how to increase their incomes. So person B, person two, looks at how can I increase my monthly income to 3,000, then to 4,000. And it might not be able to be done through your day job because you might be on an hourly, an hourly rate rather than a commission. And therefore, you might need to think about what side hustles can I do? What can I do on the side to earn extra income? And that's the, the way we need to start thinking just generally, not, not necessarily everyone that's going to invest in property, just everyone in general needs to start thinking more like that. Uh, number two, the other thing that's stopping you, which I would say is probably the more impactful one right now and the one I hear the most is the market is too competitive right now. And you, you, you know, it's, it's, you find it really difficult when you go out there and you see lots of people on viewings and you hear things going quicker. And there's the belief that well, I can't do it. The, the deals aren't out there. And I hear that from people. And I think it's, it is difficult, but it is, the deals are out there and it is possible. This is, this is my latest purchase. This is a you know, £54,000 purchase price, £22,000 in refurb, and hopefully the end value there will be uh, £95,000 when it comes to refinance. Now, you might say, well, Justin, you know, you've got it fortunate because you've built up a team, you've built up this powerhouse sourcing, and therefore you get access to deals, which is to an element true. But there are other people doing it. Uh, James, I don't know if he's watching. Um, hopefully he doesn't mind me telling a bit about his story. James Piercy, who is actually... Um, currently, you know, managing my personal training, my plan, my gym plan. He lives down here on the South Coast, yet he invests five hours away as well in the Northwest. He's managed to find this really nice two bedroom terraced house not far from mine for £62,000. He's spent just over 20 on it and he's currently going through the uh, refinance process trying to get a similar kind of end value, that 95 to 100000 and, you know, he has a business, he has a gym down here and he has a personal training business to run full time. He can't get up there every single week, yet he put in the graft to make connections um, uh, with people, other investors, but also estate agents. And he has reaped the benefits from that. So these kind of deals are out there. They're out there to be secured by us if you have enough persistence. And then the last thing I just want to work past, and then we'll actually get onto some information that you can take and apply, is, um, sorry, is I'm worried about a recession, which is a completely um, understandable worry. I'm worried right now. And I think for the fact that you just need to address the fact that this is what economies do, and economies have to cycle. They have to go up, they have to go down. They can't continue on an upward trajectory always. And as long as you learn about recessions and you take it upon yourself to sort of talk yourself through that, then you can help yourself a lot. And one thing that I, I've stressed a lot, in, and you'll have heard me say this in quite recent videos, is time in the market versus timing the market. And it's an ever such a cliche saying, but I want to just continue saying it until people get this is, you know, uh, time in the market is, you know, buying and holding for a long period of time. 10 years, 20 years, um, you know, long period of time so that you ride straight upwards, hopefully, rather than on all of these waves versus trying to, you know, timing the market, which is actually more difficult than you think. You know, when is the top of the market? When is the bottom of the market? And when, you know, knowing that property takes three, four months to buy right now with the mortgage, it takes so long to get through conveyancing. How can you know that you're timing that at exactly the right time, the right moment? So think more about investing for the long term. Try and get a good price, but think about more investing at the long term. You know, we all, or I say we all know Warren Buffett. A lot of people know Warren Buffett. And this is slightly, you know, something that he says, which is slightly re uh, relatable. Um, the real fortunes in this country, and he's addressing the US there, but it, it is applicable 
to our country as well. The real fortunes in this country have been made by people who have been right about the business they invested in and not about the timing of the stock market. So, you know, think about the fundamentals, think about the thing you're investing in, the asset, the property, and not necessarily the time that you're buying it. Put the weight on what you're buying, not when you're buying. Uh, and that will really help. And then here's just going back to kind of, you know, that whole, the, the peaks and the troughs thing, because we're going to have recessions. You know, there was one in the early 90s. There was one in you know, 08, 09. There's potentially going to be one now in the next six months, 12 months, 24 months. Are we in one right now? We just need to learn that that's just part of the process, part of the cycle. We need to try and continue investing if we can. And those that do that, I believe, are those that have truly been successful and have created wealth over the years. In fact, uh, just to kind of drive this point home, these are two, uh, well, certainly Blackstone is one of the largest real estate companies in the world. Um, and Carol is um, one of the largest real estate companies in the US. And you can see here, when everyone's starting to think about a recession and, and kind of ease off the gas and think panic mode, how can I keep my savings in the bank, not spend any money? They're thinking we need to raise money and we need to be ready to start buying the minute that people stop buying. And they're not trying to time the market. What they're trying to do, you know, there's an element of that because obviously they'll just come in with all this money when everyone else stops. They're trying to time everyone else's fear. They're trying to be greedy when everyone else is being fearful, basically. So they're two of the biggest um, you know, um, real estate companies, and they're just raising money right now, raising money, sitting on it, raising it, sitting on it, because they know that there's opportunity just from buying, holding, buying, holding. So, um, And they're the three things, really, that I just wanted to work past with you to start with before we move on to the methods that I use um, in order to find houses. Just a quick drink break. I'm already starting to lose my voice. Um, so the methods that I use, um, you know, there's a few of them, and not just for finding my own houses, but for sourcing properties, I will come on to share with you next. Um, the first thing I wanted to say prior to, to going into that is um, I talk about bottlenecks, or where I am here, which sounds like a bizarre thing to talk about. But uh, when it comes to businesses and, you know, property should be run as a business, um, you know, particularly with property, there is a bottleneck, which is finding the houses. And that is because most of the houses are completely unique, completely different. It's not like, you know, if you were an e-commerce company and you just continue to buy the same products and sell the same products, because you can, all you have to do is worry about the number of things you're buying and the number of things you're selling. With property, every property more or less is different. It's an individual house, individual title, individual conveyancing process. And therefore, it's a bottleneck in our business. So we need to work on how can we find more good properties. And if we can try and overcome that and do things to overcome that, then we are overcoming the largest bottleneck within our property business. And that's what I always try to think of when I think about ideas for um, sourcing properties. Now, when it comes to finding our own properties, when it comes to you know, sourcing properties, the first thing we need to think about or first place we all end up is naturally property portals. And I'm going to try and slightly open your mind up on what you can do with portals. But to an extent, a portal, a property portal is what it is. It's a search platform. The reason we should all start here and the reason we do all start here is because this is where the motivated sellers are. We know that a house that's on here, the owner has taken their house and they've listed it. And therefore, these are motivated sellers. And the, the plus side to it being that they are motivated, they're ready to sell. The downside being that, you know, everyone uses this as their entry point to property. So it means more competition when you go to make offers. Um, so what can we do, I guess, to overcome that? Um, well, to start with, you know, it, it comes down to volume. And, and this is something that I've probably spoken about before. I do quickly want to touch on it again. Uh, I want to introduce you to Dave here. And this is Dave's funnel of viewings to offer ratio except you know to um offer ratio and dave here starts in property he does um 10 viewings one month and makes one offer gets zero accepted and then he starts to moan and says this, this property stuff is really hard it's really frustrating i've done 10 viewings i wasted two days of my time in fact three days because i was 
calling and looking for them in, on one of the days, and then I was actually viewing them on two of the days. Made an offer, it was accept, it wasn't accepted. This is this is ridiculous. You know, right now we can't buy houses, and, and I I hear that a lot, and I know it is tough. So I'm not taking the Mickey out of people. I'm just um, I guess sharing with you the things that I hear and how we can take that next step. Um, and now I'll introduce you to Paul. Now, Paul's probably a little bit too far on the other end and he's doing 100 viewings per month. And maybe that is too excessive, too much time taken, too many houses got, you know, driven to. Arguably, you could say, could he have shortlisted those properties better? Could he have managed his time better? But Paul's doing 100 viewings, he's making 50 offers and he's getting four accepted. And the reality is right now is that Estate agents don't need us investors. You know, whilst um, the market is hard, the market is busy, there's lots of viewings, lots of offers, they don't care about us. So we kind of have to do the volume. We have to put in the work. We have to go the extra mile. And at some point, you know, when the recession does kick in or if it kicks in and, and um, if it does impact the property market, then it will go the other way to any estate agents watching. I used to be one of these. And uh, that's when the estate agents will come back to us and, and start calling us again. And they'll say... Um, you know, Mr. Investor, we've got this house come on the market. Now, I can't remember how the last, you know, call like that because, you know, the last time I had that was, you know, a long time ago when the market wasn't so busy. And it's not the estate agent's fault. It's great for them right now. They need to capitalize on that. But when things start to quieten down, that's when we'll be more important to them and we won't have to do as many viewings. We won't have to do as many, uh, make as many offers. Um, but right now, you know, who wins this? Clearly, it's Paul. Clearly, it's Paul that's putting in the graft. He's putting in the work and he's getting the result. He's putting in the volume of viewings, offers and follow ups. Now, that's a very simplistic um, idea. But again, it's just a funny one when I have that conversation with people and I'll say, well, do you think 10 viewings is enough to secure your first house? They kind of a light bulb can sometimes go off. And um, I'm hoping that that's happening for some of you right now. Um, the other thing I do that, you know, for anyone that's, you know, very data minded or finance driven like me is I run just like a, I create a little key performance indicator spreadsheet. I've said this a million times before, I'll say it again. If we run, if we're in working nine to five and they ask us to fill in KPIs, we should probably do it in our own business. We should probably, you know, make a, make a game out of it, you know, gamify it a bit. And we can go to this and we can every month we can go, right, I've done this many viewings, this many offers, I've had this many sales agreed. Um, and if we're seeing we're doing loads of viewings and, you know, we can start to see changes in the market before potentially everyone else hears about them or sees about them. Because if we're getting none accepted and we continue doing loads of viewings and then we start getting more accepted, then all of a sudden um, we can um, actually see what's going on before the actual, um, I guess, the media come out with it. Um, I have just seen someone saying, it, is it blurry? Hopefully um, the connection is holding up all right. Um, apologies. I think we're running okay from, from, our, from what I can see. So all good. Thank you, Daniel. I'll continue. Um, another thing I wanted to share with you is, is when we're looking on the portals, when we are looking at properties online, is there a way that we can gain advantage on the properties that are already out there? Because uh, if we take this property, for example, what I've done here, if um, I think you can see my mouse moving around, is this is a straight, you know, two bedroom Victorian terrace house. Victorian terrace are great because you've got suspended floors. You can take them up easier if you want to do things like, you know, uh, the pipe work uh, and the electrics and everything versus, you know, bungalow with concrete floors, for example. So what I've done here is literally, as you can see, is where the bathroom used to be, made that into a bedroom three because we've got a window there. And then we've tucked the, um, put a little um, kind of lobby area in that front bedroom, split it off because it's so big and added a bathroom in. Now, someone might have gone and looked at this at a two bedroom and it's on the market, let's say for 90,000. They're going, right, I'm probably going to have to spend 20 grand here. So I'm in it for 110. Oh, it's only worth 120. Um not for me, can't offer 90, can't even offer 80. Versus, um, you know, you might be able to go along and go, well, actually, well, I know that three beds in the, in the road get 140 or 150, whereas the two beds only get 120. And I see this more than you'd think. And this is actually a concept brought to me by a friend of mine, Joe, who helps source with me. Shout out to Joe if he's watching. He really dr drove this one home for me because I think there is more opportunities out there that we do sometimes miss. And this is one of them. So, you know, if this did have an M value of 140 
and it's on the market for 90, you know, all of a sudden you can actually probably offer 90 or you can offer 85, maybe even, off, you know, offer 80. Whereas the person that was leaving this as a two bed would have had to have gone in much lower to have made this a successful investment. Um, just drive home with another one. You know, the, the thing that I think is really important here to remember is that, that bathrooms don't require windows, um, but bedrooms must have windows. So what we want to do is we want a, a nice sized bathroom that has a window that we can make into a bedroom. And then we want to try and tuck that bathroom and, and maybe steal a bit of the biggest bedroom if we can, or steal a bit between two rooms if we can. Um, but you'll be surprised that even just adding a third small bedroom can be quite impactful to a value because these days people work from home, home offices, you know, having that additional bedroom can be impactful to the end value. So just have a look in that road. If it is all two bed and three bed terraces, what's the, what's the value difference between them? Can, can that help you find a deal that's just sitting there on right move and there's so many other things you can do you know corner plots um you know different styles of house that you can try and tap into just try and think a little bit differently from the typical investor because i've been guilty of just going out there um and, and not looking hard enough or not looking for i guess extra opportunities number two you'll have heard me talk about this one um a bit more which is uh direct to vendor and i i talk about this one a fair bit or have done in these live streams because I've had quite good success from it. My last uh, three purchases for my own portfolio, my last three purchases have been direct with the landlord. And there's two methods that you can do these. And I call them blanket or bespoke. I couldn't think of what else to call them. But blanket being we can, we can do a widespread, lots of letters hitting every door, bespoke, yeah, sorry, not bespoke, generic letter. So, it, you know, Miss, dear Mr. Landlord or dear homeowner, and we, we send it out. We maybe try and cover ground. We try and do 1,000 or 2,000 or 4,000. And we hope to get a response off the back of that. Obviously, the downside being that we might hit a lot of tenants. You know, in some of these areas that we are investing, we might hit a lot of tenants. But in some areas, um, you might get through to people um, and, and it might work. The method I slightly prefer is bespoke, which when I say bespoke, it means that we are, you know, we're finding an address that maybe has a pain point to it, maybe looks a bit run down. Um, we don't want to insult the owner, but we want to kind of, you know, very courteously say, you know, I've seen your property, you know, wondered if you'd like to sell it. I'm looking for houses in the road. I know it, you know, know it quite well. So we, we find that house um, and we take that specific address. We, we punch it in on, online and we get the owner's details. Um, that might be a question I cover later on if, if people want to know how to do that. But that's very achievable um, to actually find like the name, their home address. And then we're sending that letter to the home address rather than their rented tenants, you know, the, uh, the, the investment properties address. And even if you do 10 a month of those and you start to get, you know, one response through, two response through. The first time I had a response, you know, I think it was a no. No, no, second time I had a response, it was a no. First time it was a yes. Um, but it's nice just to hear. It's nice to know that your letter is doing something. And from that, you can kind of gauge how well have you written it, what do you need to change, and so on. The next thing being... Um, and um, some some landlords on here are um, will be annoyed that I'm putting this one out here because they might start to get some messages. And um, it's open rent and spare room. So if you imagine that although these are landlords that are wanting to rent a property out, they are adding their own house to open rent and spare room. So I guess in a roundabout way, you could call them a direct vendor lead, because if you message them on this platform, you're probably messaging a landlord. Now, you might say, well, they want to rent their house. This is not a lead. And correct, the, there is a higher percentage that you are just going to hit a landlord. He doesn't want to sell. He wants to rent. He wants to keep, keep the property and make some cash flow. But there is also a percentage there where they are actually, they've got a house. The tenant's just given them notice and is about to leave next week. And they don't want to put it on the, on the for sale. You know, they want to sell it because they don't want it uh, empty for three or four months. They're thinking, I don't want it sitting empty for three or four months. I'll just put it on the rental market. Let's get a new tenant in there. Then I'll think about selling it in the future or, or I'll keep it. So if you hit them, sometimes it's all about timing. And if you hit them at the, the right time, you might actually find someone. But the, the chances are you're going to have to do the volume work in this as well. You're going to have to send out 20, 30, 40 messages. Might only get one or two responses. And hopefully one of those might be good. Now, the next thing I'm going to share with you isn't known by many people. I think maybe people are starting to get a bit, um, understand it a bit more. Um, and there'll be many investors 
and educators that won't want me to share this. And that is the Gazette. Um, some people think this is a terrible and it, they don't use it. I, again, I see more success from it in the South than I have the North. But um, this is basically uh, every, everywhere in the UK is covered by the Gazette. And it's the official public record, as you can see there. Now, it has a section called wills and probates that you can go on. You can punch in your postcode, obviously slightly adapt um, the, the postcode around it, slightly adapt the information on what you're trying to get out of it and the dates and everything. But effectively, you can, it's a bit morbid you can find the, the um, latest deceased records and you can find the solicitor that is dealing with the estate of their property or just their estate in general. And sometimes you can actually get direct contact with the family. So you've got to be very careful in how you approach things and be very careful about how you're writing letters, writing emails. But on here are potential properties where they are you know, going to be empty. They are going to be passed to a new family member and then they'll be sold off. So what you want to do is try and jump in with the solicitor and build that relationship. You know, it only takes one with a solicitor and then you might have a relationship going forward where they send you other probate properties. So it all comes down to the amount of work you put in. Um, but the Gazette is a nice secret that people don't want, don't like me sharing. But I figure, listen, um, it, you know, we're all in this. There's hundreds and sorry, there's more than hundreds. There's tens of thousands of houses, hundreds of thousands of houses in the UK. We can all do this. We can all be successful. And, you know, I want to share things that help you in this presentation. So give it a, give it a try and just see if you have any luck with it. There are some alternative methods I won't run through now. Um, but I can, you know, in the future, which is, you know, running paid ads for DTV letters. I've been doing this myself recently, having marginal success. I'm very close on the verge of paying uh, an ads agency to help me do it and actually help me double down on it. Um, there's T boards, which is more for like, you know, uh, boarding and branding for when you start to get a few properties, you know, if you're sourcing and you're managing a few for clients, or if you've, you're, you know, bought your own and you're doing a refurb, you know, you can start to do your own, uh, um, advertising and then there's hiring, hiring staff to help out with it, which is more for people once you get a few houses and you might be able to start paying people off the cash flow to help with viewings. It might be able to uh, help you with the operations, the refurb side of it, but really in terms of actually like, um, finding properties, that's probably the last thing you'll do either if you're you, you probably do it if you're sourcing, you're making good income or you might do it if you've built up a, a really good portfolio. There are there, again, there's lots more methods than that. I really wanted to hone in on, you know, what can you how can you effectively use a portal better and how can you use direct to vendor better? Um, and I'm already 32 minutes into this. I was trying to smash this out in 30 minutes, I've probably got another 10 minutes and then we go to Q&A. Now, I quickly want to touch on how sourcing works. Before any of you tune out, because I know a lot of you are skeptical about sourcing, either you don't want to hear about it, you don't want to learn about it. And that was me, genuinely, that was me. And I just want to introduce you to this concept, which is closed minded versus open minded people. Okay. And this isn't meant to dig at anyone. I very much in the past have been a closed minded person. I now try to be more open minded. And, you know, if you think about this on a, on a really high level, you know, let's think about someone like Elon Musk. And I'm not comparing me or, or anyone to Elon Musk, he's a, he's a very unique individual. However, you know, to get to that level of business, to get to that you know, level of success, you know, you, do you think he's been closed minded? No, he's had to be open minded. That's to think almost to a crazy level. And then he's had to, you know, let experts come in and teach him about things and try things and learn things and then go, well, that one wasn't for me. Oh, but that one did. I tried it and it did work. And that's why he also pays people that have got, you know, knowledge levels above his, have got technical ability above his. He's very much a visionary, but he's open to learning about how things work um, and talking to people about it. So if there's anything you take from tonight, whatever it is, try and be more open minded towards that certain thing. Maybe it's an investment strategy. Maybe it's sourcing. Maybe it is just trying a new technique. Maybe it's trying the Gazette, for example. It's more work. It's graft. Give it a go. Be open minded that it might work and you never know where that might end up. Um, and. This was me. This was closed minded. Justin worked nine to five job and, you know, fairly good salary, was skeptical about sources. So I wouldn't do it. And then I ended up doing, you know, multiple viewing trips, you know, where I would drive five hours. I paid for a hotel. I'd view 20 houses in one go, come back down only to find no houses for me to buy. Yet maybe there was two or three in that process that other investors would have 
absolutely killed for and loved but I had such a set criteria for myself that I missed those or didn't pay attention to those so I wasn't being open-minded versus this guy who's aged a bit but he's open-minded he's open-minded Justin who quit his job he works full-time in property and um, yeah I'm putting numbers out there now which is I'm a bit uh, was a bit worried about doing but let's do it 85k revenue from sourcing in the last 12 months and um, see more property opportunities than ever. And what I mean by that is more things hit my desk than they ever have before, more properties, more opportunities. And that's good if you're an investor as well, because if, if you're seeing more potential you know, investments, you can take some of those and then you can source the ones to help you, you know, build your cash flow. Um, so what is sourcing? For those of you that have stayed and, and have remained open or gonna be open-minded, whether you like the idea of it or not, sourcing is one of the biggest skills that you can have in property because whether you are sourcing and selling or whether you're sourcing for your own portfolio, we are all sourcing. We're all trying to source houses for ourselves or for other people. So acquiring that as a skill is a fantastic thing to do. But effectively sourcing is, you know, you've got a property and you've got a sourcer in the middle and then you've got the investor at the end. A sourcer is a middleman. They are someone very much like even, let's try and compare it to other things. Even if, if, you're, if you've got a very rich individual, they are too busy, too important to find themselves at home. They would hire a bespoke real estate agent to go out and do viewings for them, shortlist houses, make offers, and it's like a home buying service. Much like that, a sourcer does that for property investors or you know, in a football club football club wants a new player they're trying to get you know a certain person within within their team you know there is an agent involved in that as a middleman to help do the negotiations help set up the contract um, and help with the transition so it, it happens in all industries it's just possibly um sourcing where it has a bit of a bad reputation and that comes down to possibly some bad sources out there um, but there's, there's a huge opportunity in the sourcing market to provide quality uh, and there's another way that you can do sourcing, which is, you know, to start with, a lot of people don't have the investor database that I do, for example, you know, where I'm, I've been on YouTube, I've been networking so much, I've managed to build up well over a thousand people on my mailing list. And where someone beginning, I appreciate, doesn't have that, doesn't have that opportunity. So what they do is they go out and find the properties and then they pair up with someone like me, Property X, and then we work together to find an investor for that good deal and match it all together. Why would someone use a sourcer? Well, it usually comes down to lack of time. They are unable to find and secure deals. Um, maybe they're rapidly trying to grow their portfolio and they go, well, I'm just going to put out loads of connections with sourcers because I just want as many deals coming in as possible. Um, or they understand the benefits of a good deal. You know, an investor that's been in the game for over a year or two will start to really understand and appreciate that if a good deal, you know, if a deal is good, who cares if you have to pay a couple of thousand, you know, two, three, four thousand pounds for it? Because if the numbers work, the numbers work. So there are a lot of people that work with sources. Um, but why would you become one? Well, first of all, cash flow. Cash is king in any business, and property investing is incredibly draining on resources, one of those being cash. So if you can start to replace cash by investing in houses, uh, sorry, selling houses as well as investing in them, it's a very good business model. Um, you can build out your network and your connections. It's a great opportunity to meet other investors. The amount of people I've met off the back of this is insane. Some of those, you know, uh, incredible level, which I've learned stuff off as well. And obviously you build up a reputation with those investors. You know, if you are someone that pulls a trigger, takes action, does things, you know, you build up your reputation and, uh, and estate agents, you know, if you continue buying and selling houses with them, they'll start to send you stuff because they're like, well, this guy's really good and he's always got an investor he'll, or he'll always buy them himself. Um, and if you are doing trips to find properties, well, you can now utilize your time better. You can do trips and viewings and you tie it all in together for your own portfolio and for the ones you sell. How much do sources earn? Well, I've shared my income for, from sourcing. As I said, although slightly worried about doing so, I think it's important to be transparent. And I'm also incredibly proud of it. So it's like a, yeah, it's a difficult one. But how much do sources earn? Caveat. Sourcing is not a get rich quick scheme. I wish it was, but it's quite stressful at times. Um, you will not become financially free in seven days um, as much as some other people, not going to say who, uh, will share that with you. Um, but sadly, that is not true. 
And it takes time and effort to find good houses and to meet investors. This isn't going to happen overnight. This isn't going to happen in one week. This will take takes a couple of months to get, get momentum going. But once you do, it's very rewarding, very good skill to have, as I've already said. So now I've got the caveats out of the way. How much the sources earn? Well, one, they earn, you know, so let's say they earn you know, £3,000 for a deal, um, which is probably your average fee if you're sourcing on a buy, refurbish, refinance deal. Well, we've got, you know, beginner sources. We might say that they look to do maybe one to two deals per month. If you do one deal per month, you are still absolutely laughing because that's £3,000 per month. That's £36,000 per year in revenue. And the profit will probably be 30 to 40% um, for most people because obviously you've got to pay for ads, pay for driving, you know, your time. So, you know, you do need to try and beef that up a little bit because revenue isn't profit. So, uh, but I'm operating around 50% on my sourcing business. So it's still remarkably profitable. Um, and as I scale up, that'll probably, the profits will diminish. Now, a medium level sourcer, maybe a small company, which I'm starting to get into this region now. You know, I started off much slower. I was doing, you know, two to four deals per month. Now I'm starting to reach slightly bigger numbers. And again, it does fluctuate. Um, but uh, four to six deals per month, you might see, you know, kind of like these mid-level sources doing. And, you know, that's 12 to 18K in revenue per month, 144 to 216 revenue per year. So that's revenue, not profit. Please let me stress that. And then obviously large sourcing companies. I see these companies pumping out deals every day, every week. And I think, man, these guys are on it. Um, and these are the guys that you're seeing doing the we buy any house, you know, those kind of things. You think they're actually buying every house? No, probably not. They're probably sourcing most of them. So when you see we, we buy any house and, you know, now you know, that's probably a sourcing company. It's a good chance. Now, last thing, I'm going to absolutely speed through this because I just want to get onto the Q&A. And I think that's where I can add value to you. Um, what do you want your life to look like? Now, and that can be related to whether you are, you know, the houses you're buying or the houses you're sourcing. You know, what is your made it moment? Is it leaving your job, which for a, a huge percentage of people it is? Is it a new heart, a new home, a new home? A car, a watch, a handbag, holidays, you know, is it a materialistic thing, which there is absolutely nothing wrong with? Um, is it even just the comfort of additional income? To have the peace of mind that, you know, if you wanted to book a holiday, you can just go and book a holiday rather than thinking, I'd like to go on holiday, I better start saving for it. So is it just the comfort, comfort of additional income and also knowing that you can probably afford your heating bill in the winter? That would be a nice comfort to have. For me, it was working for myself and it was for like five years straight. It was enough to send anyone completely cuckoo and mental, but I just thought about it almost every day. And by the time of, of my sort of end, the end of my career was coming, I was practically unemployable because I was just so hyper focused on this one goal. And honestly, it was the best thing I ever did. Still is the best thing I ever did. Um, and then to achieve those goals, we need to start thinking about reverse engineering the process to get there. So if it is, investing in properties how many properties do we need to buy per year to reach that goal here you can see i've laid out two to three buy to lets per year for five or six years will get me eg three thousand pounds per month that's an example one and um i think the important thing to do is, is is do this for sourcing as well you know if you're like well i'd like to quit my job okay well how much income do you need to replace oh i need to replace 30 grand income okay we well, probably need to source one deal a month you know, try and break it down into measurable steps. Try not to run before you can walk. Let's just think about that first milestone. Then we can think about those bigger ones, buying the supercars, the Rolexes, all the fun stuff. Um, but bonus points, open up your mind to growth. Build a circle around you that believe in your goal. If you tell someone you want to earn 70K a year from sourcing and they, they don't provide some sort of positiveness or insight or value, or, you know, they're probably not the person for your circle. Get advice from people that are ahead of you, not behind you. It's very interesting how many people talk about property investing, but they've never done it. Um, and then seek progression rather than just a pound sign because it's fairly um, empty. You know, just hitting numbers is quite empty, whereas actually just trying to be a better person every day, yourself, your business, you know, your property portfolio, just try and progress that slowly. As humans, I think we actually get more value and more uh, happiness out of the progression side of it. Now, just before the q and I've got an offer for you. I told you I had an exclusive offer. The Sourcing Startup by PropertyX. Now, this is a brand new comprehensive training video. 
uh, a group of videos. And this is something that this is probably the most requested thing I've had for a long while, which is pretty mad. I didn't think about it before that was just questions about sourcing. So people weren't requesting a course, but they were requesting these certain questions, which I just banked and built up over time. So I have built a step-by-step -step video training program uh, for sourcing. And this is everything from how to start a sourcing business, how to find things, uh, properties. So everything we've covered today, but in a much higher level of detail. And I've broken this down into eight modules, which is actually 30 videos. And there's seven documents there, direct to vendor letters, offer emails, you name it, it's on there, you know, spreadsheets and builders contracts. And it's, it's all presentations. So I'm walking you through things at a very high level. And this is ready for you to, you know, ready to be looked at if there's anyone that wants to get going straight away. And as I've said, there's lots of documents, as you can see here, included in it. So this is for anyone that wants to, you know, not necessarily go full time into property. You know, if you want to earn an extra bit of money on the side, you're doing viewings anyway, you're buying houses anyway. Let's just try and, let's try and get you sourcing, try and earn a bit, of money, a bit of extra money. That's how I started it. And then I, within like three, four months, I was doing it full time. So that's an exclusive offer for tonight. Um, I'm doing 33% off the list price. So I've got a list price for this product and I've knocked 33% off for the next 24 hours only. In fact, for anyone that signs up within a couple of hours after watching this, I'll give you a free call. I'll just, I'll look out for the purchase. I'll um, reply to your email and I'll offer you a free one-to-one -one call for an hour on Zoom. So it's one call for an hour just to help coach you in the right direction. But this course is going to be everything that you need to start a sourcing business. Yeah, I've, everything I've learned in like 12 months, I've literally just tried to package into one thing. And there's a lot of mistakes in there, a lot of lessons, and obviously a lot of success, as you can see from the revenue. Um, so that is sourcingstartup.com. The link is in the description. This offer runs for 24 hours only. And obviously the offer with the call only runs for a couple of hours. So jump on that. I'd love to see some of you in there. And um, now the q and I've seen things popping off down the side here. So I'm hoping for some, um, some exciting questions. Let me try and um, scroll up a bit, but I appreciate all of you that have stuck around for so long. Oh, excuse me. Very thirsty. Um, bear with me. I'm just trying to find some questions that will, uh, will benefit everyone. What's this one here from Daniel? Do you always look first at adding another bedroom when searching for houses? I don't do that first. That's that's kind of like a just something to have in the back of your brain. For me, I with the properties I've bought for my own portfolio um, and I've refurbished, I always I always opt for the the I guess keep things simple model, which is if the kitchen's in a good place, if the bathroom's in a good place, if you know if the bedrooms are in a, in a fine layout, then stop trying to go in and turn everything upside down, change the layout for the sake of it. If you think you can go in, buy at the right price, keep that refurb down by keeping the same layout and then obviously try and refinance at the higher value. This is, this is for ones where, you know, just to have in the back of your mind, because if you really are spending a lot of time on these property portals and you're finding that I just can't find anything or like, how can that house be worth 90,000 when the end value is 110 or 120 and I've got to spend 20 grand on it? that's for these properties you know can you do this can i actually oh actually i can afford to buy pay 30 um 85 for that because actually i can add value and something like moving the bathroom is a fairly simplistic one if you're going to be refurbishing a bathroom anyway then moving it to another part of the house provided it's in like a victorian terrace all you need to be able to do is check that you can uh, get a soil pipe to the, the the place you're moving it to everything else pipe work wise isn't too complex if it's in like a victorian house so i'd say um yeah certainly something i look at just maybe not the first thing anyway um uh let me just see what else there is i'm glad to hear that the gazette was a good one I only had good intentions with sharing that one i've got some people here that think they're hilarious by saying um it's not good that you're messaging people when the family have died that is not my intention these these are open to other investors. So why why should our, us as investors not get involved with them as well? Um, so I think it's fair to share them with everyone. I'm not trying to be you know a shady person by sharing that with everyone. Um, how much do you spend on direct to vendor letters and 
what would the response rate look like? Uh, month to month, it's very different what I spend on uh, D2V letters. And it depends if I'm going for the blanket or bespoke model. I tend to opt more for the bespoke model. Uh, I've also been pumping a lot of time and money into the paid ads through like Facebook and Insta. For, for people that are getting started, I would opt for the letters. I would honestly just, I would rather than trying to work out how much money to put aside, I would work out how many letters that you want to start with. So start with 10, then can I double that to 20? Can I double that to 40? It gets quite time consuming and I've had to try and build in processes to help me do it because it is so time consuming. So start with 10, start, then do 20 and um, you'll see it, the cost does run up quite high, but actually it's more the, the cost of time, the admin uh, and that side of it. In terms of response rates, um, you're looking at what I found is actually I get quite a good response rate from those bespoke ones. So I'm like 15 to 20% on those. In fact, the first two I ever sent out, I got one response and I bought it, which was a 50% hit rate. I'd have ha happily carried that conversion rate on, but it hasn't, it hasn't transpired like that naturally. So 15 to 20%, I, from what I gather, from the ones I've done, I haven't looked into the numbers massively, but from the, from the large blanket mail outs, I get like under 10%, it's like eight or 9%. So that's what you can tell why now I've gone down the route more of the bespoke because I kind of know that actually it's a bit cheaper to do that. It's a bit more selective. It's a bit more personalized to the landlord and I get a better response because of that. And sometimes the response will be, no, I'm not looking to sell. Sometimes the response will be like, oh, in fact, I had one recently. Um, I would sell, but I paid X, how, you know, X amount for this property in 2007. And you look online and you go, wow, they paid 110,000 for that in 2007. The going rate for it's like 85 okay so it will throw up opportunities that you can't always go ahead with like that because you know the, in that particular area in that road which isn't common very more anymore the prices hadn't yet caught up with what that person overpaid for it in 2007 i could do a lease option there but that's a whole nother story there's a whole nother strategy that we won't go into right now um thank you very much that's very kind and um well, I like to think I've deserved it. I put a lot of work in, a lot of long days and had the right support in order to do it. Um, let's see what this one is. Did you get the sourced property under offer before advertising it to an investor on the list? That's a great question. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, I do personally. I know people that don't, um, but I think it's important to try and do that. And obviously, of course, it takes a little while to, to um, work through the issues that come with that when you're dealing with estate agents, when you're dealing with vendors and you're getting the offer accepted and then you're swapping the buyer over. Um, but it's actually quite an easy tran uh, transition. Once you've done it a few times, once you start building relationships up with certain es estate agents, which now we are actually, we're at a point where certain estate agencies within certain areas will give me like a 24 hour exclusive. If I can pump that out to list prior to them marketing it, or just as they add it to right move, I get 24 hours. If I can, you know, the, the vendor has agreed to this slightly lower price, if I can go and get a buyer. But that comes with like time in the game. I'm still building those relationships up and I could still do a, a lot more of those. Um, but absolutely, always trying to get it under offer prior to advertising it because I don't want to get someone's hope up, hopes up who's an investor. I don't want to mess them around. Investors, you know, they really are the, the core of my business. So I want to treat them with, with the utmost respect with their time. Um, how, how you go source many properties at auction? I, you can't really source property to auction, George. Um, you can if you're getting in with the auctioneer and he brings you that deal at a certain price prior to the, the day it goes to hammer, you know, the, prior, um, the day it goes to auction and the hammer falls. If you've got plenty of notice and you've got the legal packs and you've got a, a deal and agreement with the auctioneer, you can do that. And I, I know people that do do that. Um, Jack, mate, appreciate you a lot. Um, for anyone watching, you know Jack. He's been on the channel a few times. Um, Jack has a very successful sourcing business, and he's absolutely killing it as well. Um, he's even started hiring people. I'm quite jealous when I go up there and I see how well he's running his efficient little team. Um, so good to see Jack on here. Appreciate you, mate. Um, here we go, Matt. So question, when you agree to buy a property and the estate agent says, send me your proof of funds, what do you say to them? to then hand it over to an investor. How do you get around the issues? Um, again, it's quite a complex one. And obviously <clears throat> goes without saying that I go into more detail in the course, but effectively the easiest way to do it is, um, you, we, there are two ways to do it. 
A, either have a very open, transparent, honest relationship with the estate agent, um, which easier said than done, again, comes back to sourcing, have a, having a bad rep from some sources. So it depends on the estate agent's experience on it, and it depends on how they they dealt with it, how much they understand it. And the other option being that um, you get to, a, if you're starting out, possibly what you might do is tell them it's, you know, and kind of go down the route of that it's your business partner and that you'll, um, you know, either you'll get the, the proof of funds sent over within 24 hours. Um, so maybe just bear, bear with me for 24 hours. I'll get you the ID, the proof of funds, the solicitors, um, do it in, in that method. Um, so, yeah. Um, da, da, da. Do you know investors who can be interested about buy to service accommodation in Liverpool, Manchester? Yes, I do. Yeah, I've um, got quite a few people that are turning to that strategy. In fact, I've got a few people looking for new builds as well, if anyone should know any. Um, I'm 19, got 25K saved up. And do you think I should buy my first property as a house to live in for a year, pay less stamp duty? Or do you think it's worth just buying it as a rental property? I mean, there's so many ifs, buts and caveats in this one, uh, Ethan. I my immediate response is if that property is local to you, if you can add extreme value to it, then do it yourself. Move in, live there, pay less stamp duty, put down less deposit, add the value and then refinance money out or sell it for a profit. Because, of course, if it's your own home and the, the other additional benefit is the fact that you don't pay capital gains tax on the profits if you've been there a certain amount of time. Um, so, yeah, add the value refinance it or sell it and that will be tax-free money that you can then take to invest if it doesn't have a value add then i'd maybe go down the route of the buy to let so it depends on the circumstance i hope that makes sense i'm um, i'm answering them a bit quicker because i just want to get to as many as i can uh can you recommend a mortgage broker for properties i live down south <clears throat> excuse me and I have a minimum mortgage amount for a first-time buyer I live at home with my parents and buying. Yeah, I can. Sorry, the, the short answer to that is uh, drop me a message on Instagram and I will introduce you to my mortgage broker. Great to see a fellow southerner. Um, what's your sourcing terms? How to reserve it? And what are the, what are the cancellation policies? I need to view and get inspection first before payment. Not going to happen with a lot of sources. Um, the point of sourcing is they're taking out the pain of the viewing, of the, the searching, the viewing, the trips, and what they're doing is they're packaging it up for you. Now, I appreciate if it's your first investment, that's quite risky and it seems a bit daunting. And therefore, maybe if it is your first investment and you're worried about that, you might want to go find it yourself. If you do need a sourcer to help you with that, then you need to understand like for most sourcing companies, um, what happens is, is they will take commitment from you, which is a, you know, t terms and conditions. It's 50% uh, of the fee. And then they will allow you to view the property. Um, but they, the problem is, is if you then go and view the property and you go, actually, well, not for me, or actually no, I've changed my mind. I don't think I want to buy an investment property. They've lost the, the relationship potentially, or they put it at risk. They've lost the direct to vendor relationship or the relationship with the estate agent because they've agreed a sale and they've messed people around. I appreciate it's not ideal. Like it's, there is no completely ideal scenario. Um, of course, when I do it, when I take someone, you know, when someone signs up, when I take a deposit for the sourcing fee, if there is anything that comes up down the line, then, you know, really open to, you know, for example, if you were buying something and something comes up in the survey, it's not just a case of, sorry, you're pulling out, you've lost your money. It's an open conversation. We talk about, you know, okay, that's a real shame that you've got to pull out, you know, or can we renegotiate that off the price, the amount? Okay, no. Okay, right. Well, then what we'll do is we'll transfer that money over to another deal. Okay, we'll put that money on credit. Another deal comes up. You can buy that off, you know, from us and we've already got your deposit. So we try and be fair, but it has to be give and take from both sides. And as an investor looking to use the sourcing company, you should think about, um, you actually physically viewing that house in person, unless you are a surveyor, doesn't add much value. The difference between a sourcer and you viewing something isn't much. So your ability to de-risk actually comes from things like, you know, doing stuff online. You can do 80% of due diligence online. It comes from, um, you know, hiring a surveyor, getting a full structural survey, um, and then obviously your solicitor doing all the paperwork. 
I hope that makes sense. I hope that doesn't come across arrogant in any way. I'm just trying to explain it point by point quickly um, so we can go on to the next question. Um, we've got here, Tom. Appreciate the time, Justin. P.S. Can you check your Insta DM? Sorry about that. Sorry to anyone I haven't replied to. Are you finding many lenders downvaluing at the moment? Also, how are you finding these landlord addresses? That's a good question. I knew that would come up. Um, are you finding many uh, lenders are downvaluing at the moment? Yes. I'm finding there are a few that are downvaluing. They're being awkward. I'll quite frankly put it out here live. I'm absolutely point blank will not work with anyone that works with the mortgage works right now because I've had so many issues with downvaluations, them not wanting to lend full stop and them taking forever to book in valuations. I'm finding some lenders are being a bit picky. But then what this does do is this opens opportunity for new lenders or different lenders to come to the market and actually offer a better customer service, better rates and a better overall experience. As for the downvaluing, I've seen a bit, not a huge amount, but it's, it's not necessarily around you know, recession. It's more them wanting to, maybe they've hit their lending criteria, maybe they've hit the amount they want to lend. Um, maybe they're just being damn right awkward like TMW. So yeah, it's, I am finding it a bit, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Any property that you buy, I would, I would always have like multiple exit strategies. And what I mean by that is, do you have enough money in the bank where you're not reliant on this refinance? Can you flip this house if you don't get the refinance you want? Or can you just leave more money in if you don't get the refinance you want? If you wanted 100K, you get, you know, a 90K. Can, have you got the money where you can just, yeah, that's fine. I'll leave the extra money in. I'll get it out in two years' time. Um, although annoying, although it slows us down, it's just something we have to just think about when we're investing right now. I really encourage that. Uh, we haven't covered the other bit, which is um, also how are you finding these landlord addresses? There's a couple of different ways, um, but the most, the best way you can do is um, by actually going, you know, if you're going to a viewing and you spend five minutes each side of the viewing, walking up and down the street and make a note of the addresses, you then take them to the HM Land Registry website, you look up the address and it's very hit and miss. You know, some addresses you'll actually find it's the same address that you've punched in is where the owner lives, although you can actually clearly see it's empty. But some of those will be, for example, I had one recently where the owner lived three hours away in Oxfordshire. You know, he's absolutely no idea what's going on with his house in Liverpool. So reached out to him. He was like, yes, I, I'm, you know, starting to sell off my portfolio. Let's go. So, um, yeah, it is obviously covered in a, a lot, of, you know, a lot more detail in the deal sourcing course. Sourcing startup. What a place. What a place to be. Um as soon as you said adding value by adding a bedroom in a Victorian terrace, I clicked my whole street is an opportunity. I'm really pleased to hear that, Cameron. That is, that's genuinely awesome. There is more opportunity out there than you think. Um, when do you think is the best time of the week to go and view properties during the week to not be that busy or stick to weekend? Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Case by case, probably during the week if you really looked into it. Probably like, yeah, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is probably the best because the Friday, Saturdays are going to be round of viewings and then they tend to get the offers in on the Monday. So anything that hasn't sold on that Monday um, or anything that hits the market on that Monday, you can try and sweep up on that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But does it give you much more opportunity? A bit, but maybe not that much. Hi, Justin. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to offer this information. Pleasure. Uh, have you ever looked into or considered Airbnb? Yes, massively. I've been reviewing everything I do lately to see if I do need to make any changes with, because if you imagine the interest rates are starting to rise on mortgages, it means the cash flow is coming down on the properties, you know, where we might be going out to a buy to let and expecting to make, you know, 250 to 300 pounds profit on that buy to let. With the interest rate rises, we might now be looking at houses that only produce 200 pounds in profit. And to a lot of people, that's quite a big shock. You know, if I'm sourcing that onto people, they're going, that's a terrible return on investment or not terrible, but it's not what I was expecting. So um, not just for me, but also for clients, you know, I think the opportunity where they can have it as a single let or they can do service accommodation is very interesting. Of course, just be aware that there's something like service accommodation is always subject to change. You know, if they bring in rules and regulations, but they've been saying that for years, they will do eventually like they did the HMO market. But I think it's a very good cash flowing strategy. And the difference between you owning a house as a HMO or a normal house is quite a big change. You have to add in en suites. You have to change the layout. 
Whereas the, the difference between you running something as a service accommodation flat or a normal flat to, to renting out to a couple, it's not much. It's like furnishings. So it's quite, it's quite easy to flip between the strategies and therefore I quite like that. Um, Cameron again, thank you. Uh, can you explain the process from finding a property worthy for an investor? For me, um, if I'm sourcing something for another investor, the key is uh, providing value. You know, if I'm going to charge someone £3,000 to source in the house, I want to have added value, whether that is saving them time from viewing it, saving them time from making, you know, having tons of offers made and rejected. You know, whatever it is, I want to save time. And obviously the biggest thing for doing that is somewhere we can go in, we can add value. If I'm finding a buy, refurbish, refinance style property where, you know, we're buying it, what we consider below market value, or at least buying it for a good price, Maybe we're refurbishing it. Maybe we're even adding a bedroom, like I mentioned earlier. And then at the end, we can go, right, we can achieve this value or we should be able to achieve this value. And if we do get this value, you're only going to leave in £15,000. Okay, so it might cost you forty to invest, to do the refurb, to pay the stamp duty and the fees. But at the end, you should be able to get most of that back out. If we're, we're offering that as a service, you know, that has value to it because now, you know, someone can see there's a clear in and out value. Um, with a turnkey buy to let, it's more just about, you know, can we get them a really good, a, a true turnkey buy to let, ready to go buy to let. And what I mean by that is something that is truly ready to go. It isn't going to be ridden with maintenance six months down the line. Um, so, yeah, that's what, that's what we or that's what I look for when I'm finding a property worthy for another investor. But, of course, it comes down to talking to your target audience, talking to investors to see, you know, what they want at the end of the day. Um, that is your audience. They're the people that you're paying clients, see what they want. And particularly in the early stages of sourcing, co-source with someone that has a database. Um, or if you start to build up a few investors, maybe even talk to them. Say that I've got five investors now. You are one of them. I want to provide you the best property and value possible. What do you want? I'll go out and find it. Um, so that's an option for you. Oh, excuse me. Bit uh, bit hot in here as well as as well as a uh, bit thirsty. I'm trying to pick out. Um, trying to pick out some of the best questions here. Uh, hello, Justin. You're a regular fan here. I uh, got one question. Oh, nice one. Cheers, mate. Uh, one question. Sorry to you this question, but I just refurbished the house and my remortgage it but my property is over a coal mine near shaft is there a second part to this i mean that's that's not the end of the world you can get indemnity policies against it to provide to the new mortgage company to provide them with uh, you just need to provide lots of paperwork basically unless they're turning around and, and saying to you that they don't want to lend then you might have to try move to a different lender um and talk to your broker about it, really work through that issue. I don't know if I'm missing the problem here. Tell me if I am and I'll come back to it. But yeah, basically, you know, that's quite common in the North. There are plenty of houses over coal mines. And normally when you buy them or ahead of you refinancing them, you provide an indemnity policy, which is like an insurance policy, um, which is basically, you know, if my house falls into a big sinking hole, big coal mine below it, then uh, the insurance uh, policy has covered it. They will pay out to the lender to get their money back and they will pay me out to get my money back as well. Um, again, I'll keep an eye out for if there's another part to that question, trying to move through. Um, do you do interest only mortgages and do you do buy to let mortgages too? Um, I, I just do... In, I do interest only mortgages on my buy to let mortgages. I don't do repayment mortgages. So um, again, it will come down to what phase I'm at in my portfolio. And maybe, you know, I have a plan in which I've set out, which when I get to certain milestones, certain years that I will start to transition my portfolio over from interest only to repayment mortgages and eventually start to pay down that debt, probably closer to when I'm planning to sit on a beach in, in the South of France. But right now, you know, want to utilize um, you know, lending, want to leverage up and, and obviously put that money to work and therefore get the most cash flow for a property. Particularly right now, if you are taking something on as a buy to let, 
And with the interest rates higher, you're going to find it hard for that property to cash flow, particularly if you're doing a repayment mortgage. If we can switch that, you know, if we can look at an interest only mortgage, you know, you, if you pick an interest only mortgage at the beginning, it doesn't mean you're on it for life. You're, you're going to end up refinancing every two, five or 10 years anyway. So you could maybe do an interest only for five years and then you could think about switching to repayment. Um, and as that time comes about, you can think about that more. But yeah, me personally, not financial advice, obviously, but me personally, I uh, use interest only mortgages and um, I continue to do so for the foreseeable future. And at some point I will start to transition my portfolio over. <clears throat> Excuse me. What happens if your predicted value after refurb is less than you said to your investors? Uh, basically, I provide a couple of options. So in the sourcing pack, I give them like the best case, mid case, worst case, so that they know that, okay, in the best case scenario, we should hit this valuation. We should be able to pull out most of your money and leave in 15,000. However, with things are being uncertain, the mid case means that you'll leave 22 and a half in. And then the worst case means you'll end up leaving 30 in. And I have to provide that at the beginning. Um, and also, you know, it comes down to the investor as well, because onus is on me as the sourcer, the compliant business to do, you know, obviously provide as, as, as much due diligence around that property. I am the one that's, you know, taking control of that, selling it on to investor. But equally, there has to be certain amount of due diligence from the investor to go, yes, actually, Justin, I agree that your best mid and worst case are sensible. If not, if you don't think that about the property you're about to buy, don't buy it. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of give and take from everyone. And I think that's the fairest way to do it. Um, do you package deals with the refurbs as well? Um, sorry if I'm missing any of these questions. I'm literally just like, jumping two or three at a time, just clicking on one. Do you package deals with the refurb as well? I do project management service to, in certain areas, not in all areas, because I don't, in the areas I feel like I have a, a good enough team that I can provide a really good solid service, you know, quick turnaround, good price, um, very reliable, I'll do it. And those two places are Northwest, so like Liverpool and the surrounding uh, nearby areas and West Yorkshire. By West Yorkshire, I mean kind of like the triangle between Bradford, Leeds, Wakefield, kind of in there. Got quite a good um, little core team set up there. So, uh, yeah, so that's where I, I provide it. Elsewhere, I don't, to be honest. Right, let's go a few more down. I am. Are you still with PDJ? I'm still with big PJ. Um, yeah, he's a great accountant. He's my accountant for my businesses, and I haven't changed. In fact, we'll be doing a video update with him soon ahead of changes coming for April, 2024. Um, does the deal, oh, deal, does the sourcing course include due diligence checklists, sheets, list? It has, yes, it doesn't have a video on it, but it has a document on it. Uh, thanks for your content and well done and success. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, if you join, I will get that document over to you. It's on the course as well. Um, where are we? I reached out to you on Instagram a few months ago regarding a viewing in Cornwall. Did that deal fall through? Levi, yes, it did. Sadly, yes. I couldn't get in there in the end. Um, thank you for your help on that one. But I couldn't, couldn't get in there. Owner changed their mind forever hopeful that I can still do a deal if he changes his mind. <clears throat> um, where are we? Hey, Justin, appreciate what you do. Have you ever thought about changing your buy to lets to student accommodation, especially with interest rates rising? As I say, always a concern, always reviewing, always thinking about interest rates. Um, not, no, I haven't thought about student accommodation. I mean, I thought about it at times, sorry, but it's not the direction I'm looking to go, although I think it's possibly the better HMO strategy. If you think there's like three types of HMO that you can do, you know, professionals, rent them out room by room, students, rent them out as a house to a group of students, or uh, social housing, rent out the house to a social housing provider. I would probably, if I was doing a HMO, I would look for social housing, try and lock in like a five or 10 year lease with a social housing provider, because you only have to provide a basic level refurb. Uh, you basically give them the house with no maintenance, um, and then you get it back in five to 10 years time. Downside to that would be, you know, do they still want it in five to 10 years time? And then are you left with an, a property that's in an average area that you might not be able to HMO to, to anyone else? Um, 
obviously student accommodation is great because you don't pay council tax. You get them all, most of the time, you get them all under one AST, one um, tenancy agreement. And you go in once a year to freshen it up. And then obviously professional one being, in my eyes, possibly um, the most risky because they're all on separate agreements, higher turnover of tenants. Could be wrong here. I don't do it. I'm sure someone will, will tell me that I'm, I'm wrong. I think there's good, good and bad parts of all of them. What I would say about professional and uh, professional HMOs and service um, and sorry, student accommodation is that although, um, you know, cash flow is being affected by interest rates or normal buy to lets, at least we don't pay for the bills. So if you think the bills have gone up 50 percent, they might go up an additional 50 percent later this year or whatever the percentage is. You know, if you are having to pay the bills on a student or professional HMO, then that will just as much dent your profits. So uh, or could do for the short term. So that's just something to consider. But I, I do like it. I think it's a great cash flowing strategy. It's just not the route I'm going down, but I'm sure it would be great for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> Daniel. Hi, Justin. Really appreciate your time tonight. Oh, thank you. Thanks for being here. Did you make the effort to get fully compliant before you started sourcing? Cheers, Dan. Um, before I start, the first couple of deals I sourced, I sourced with others just to get money coming in. And I probably encourage most people to do that because being compliant it costs quite a bit of money um, or getting compliant costs quite a bit of money. I think overall you're probably going to spend 12 to 1500 pounds getting compliant from memory. And it's a, it's a yearly thing. It's going to come up again and I'm going to go, Oh, damn it. Um, but yeah, I would say uh, with that and on top of softwares and things that you might want to run, you're in it for quite a bit of money. Or what I prefer to do with anything I do is get is test it, get proof of concept. And then if it works, which obviously this does, then I double down on it. And that's what I did for sourcing. And I would encourage anyone to do that is look to just get really good at trying to find deals, talk to someone to co-source with. I'm not just constantly promoting property X to co-source with, but me or, you know, Jack was on here earlier. Go to Jack, say, Jack, what do you, what, what does your database want? What do they need? What can I provide them? He might give you a, a list of parameters. I might give you some parameters and then you go out and you find that. Take, take 50, 50 normally with like co-sourcing. So if you bring us a deal, we find you an investor, you take 50% of the fee, we'll take 50% of the fee. Um, everyone's happy, everyone gets a good arrangement out of it, providing it's an actually it's a good deal. That's the only trouble I see is when people try and bring me in, in an, for want of a better phrase, garbage. You know, they try and just selling something. And um, my normal response to that is, where's the value add? Why is someone paying us for this? Um, so yeah, that is my thought on that. Good question. Thank you for that, Daniel. I'm about to wrap up, to be honest, uh, because my voice is gone. I've, I've almost reached the bottom. Um, I think this is, this is an interesting question to end on, which is, hi, Justin, are you concerned about the new EPC changes coming into 2025? I think this is a thought on a lot of people's in he uh, heads, a lot of investors' heads. Um, yes, uh, yes and no. Like um, the properties that I currently own are like high Ds. Um, I think one's a low C. Um, and therefore, so, so basically, for anyone that doesn't know, energy performance certificate, you need them for your property. And um, as of 2025, you need a minimum of a C rating. Now, you need them, a minimum of a C rating for a new property that you're renting out for if you're about to go and get a new tenant. If you have a property and it is rented out, provided this, the tenant stays there, you don't actually need to get it up to an EPCC until I think it's 2027 or 2028. I think it's 2027. So you've, you've got a couple of extra years buffer provided your tenant doesn't leave. So you might have to, you know, buy them some gifts and uh, fluff them up a bit so they don't leave. Um, but for those properties that you are worried about, then, yeah, now is the time to start thinking, well, if I'm doing a refurb, I might as well go in there, add extra insulation, you know, think about cavity wall insulation. Uh, what else can I do? Can I put a new boiler in there? Will that get the rating up? Because um, if not, you're going to be doing a sweep of it nearer 2025 and as you can imagine everyone will be making bank on it so think about it but i wouldn't let it stop you from investing i don't trust the government enough to not change things i don't think they're going to change this one but i don't trust them this video will probably get taken down for saying that anyway uh i hope you enjoyed the video thank you for ever so much for so many people staying on i massively appreciate it don't forget to check out the sourcing startup course i put a huge amount of time and effort into that and I want to keep it super exclusive. And uh, yeah, I think for anyone that's looking to start sourcing, that's only a fraction of the cost of one source deal. So you just need to do one deal 
and you've well and truly paid for this tenfold. And the knowledge you'll take is something that I've been building over the last 12 months. So thank you, everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to do another one with these uh, with you very soon. And I hope to see you on the Sourcing Startup course very, very soon. Until then, have a great evening and I'll see you 